Alrighty, it looks like we're going back to school again. Hello, hello everyone, and thank you for joining me for another video. Uh, yeah, today I'm going to be bringing you another one of those uh, long play videos showing a lesson that I delivered recently. Uh, so this was one of my patrons, Pingu. Thank you so much again to you for your patronage, you lovely, lovely human. Uh, and we sat down and we wanted to talk about glazing. There was a couple of other things that we went over as well in the lesson, which I have cut out mostly for the sake of brevity. Um, but the main thing I wanted to go over was the actual glazing lesson, because I know it's a technique that a lot of people are a little bit apprehensive about or a little bit scared of now pingu has never glazed before uh, they told me that they have no experience prior using the technique so this is a first time entry into it and uh, you can get a look at how i explained it and you can see a lot of real-time paintings so there's going to be no sped up footage on this at all which is why looking at this video you're going to see it's quite long so uh, i'm not going to waste too much more of your time talking to you about it let's just show you what we went over um just in you know whatever your sort of main red color is so i'm using mephiston red from citadel and i've got it as you can see it's quite thin um because the color is very high coverage so it can afford to be quite thin and i'm just going to get a good even base coat over everything here And what, what this is gonna show you is is the um, the way to sort of handle these reds on flatter, sort of less textured surfaces. So the, the groundwork that you've done on the cape will be fine for when I show you the more sort of texture friendly version, uh, which I'll probably use the backpack for because the backpack's got a fair bit of texture, but you can use the cape, it's, you know, it's all the same thing. Um, and it'll all work with the same colors and everything, or mostly the same colors, but there's a slight difference in how you handle the shading when you're dealing with flat surfaces like power armor and, you know, the like. Yeah, if you'll just excuse me for one second, I'm just gonna hair dryer this. It's just a way that I can, you know, kind of get it instantly dry. Um, if you're wondering about thinning, I know people often ask questions about how much to thin your paints. Uh, this is how thin my Mephiston Red is. You can see that it's it flows very readily, but there's still a bit of transparency to it. And that's really what you're what you're looking for is. Um, or at least, you know, in, in my opinion, what you're looking for is to thin to a point where the paint still delivers from the brush easily, but it doesn't lose too much coverage. And as you may have seen in a recent video, that is kind of different from paint to paint. So it's not it's not something that's kind of universal. Uh, each paint kind of wants a different amount of thinning, and different jobs also kind of affect it quite a lot. You know, if I was uh, if I was layering, I'd probably take it thinner because I'd want some more transparency there. But for purposes of base coating, I want to be able to get to full coverage in sort of maximum three coats. Really, I don't really want to have to put more than three coats on, and so. I always, uh, I always use the back of my hand to check the opacity of my paints. It's always kind of, because I think, you know, the meat of your hand here is, uh, you know, it's fairly pale. So you can kind of see what's going on pretty well. And it, it tends to make a, a pretty useful way of <clears throat> being able to, you know, just check the consistency. I kind of, uh, I've been on a bit of a quest for the last year or so trying to uh, <clears throat> help people to realize that these tiny little brushes um, really don't help your miniature painting very much. You kind of, um, to give yourself the best chance, you really wanna be using the biggest brush you can stand to use because uh, around the sort of size two, size three mark, 
the points actually get finer on brushes, not not larger. Yeah. And um, persuading people that my size three has a finer point on it than their size zero is uh, it can be very difficult sometimes. Oh, you were you were one of the sort of zero, double zero, triple zero kind of people. I was, yes. I'm now trying to stick to a single brush. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm sure I'm sure you've kind of heard my my musings on it. You know, I I did some fairly recently. I I sort of spoke about this, but. It's it's all just to do with muscle memory development. You you learn the responsiveness of of brushes and and that becomes embedded into your muscle memory. So if you use a painting system that's asking you to constantly change brush, then you're never developing that muscle memory. And that to me it it, it seems like just, you know, asking for your progress to be slowed. Um and I I, I try to with this kind of, I guess you could call it a system that I'm starting to put together. Uh, I've tried to create a sort of way of thinking that does everything possible to, you know, to not inhibit people's progress. This is the first kind of slightly odd thing. Um, so what we're actually gonna do now is take some of our Mephiston Red um, and I'm gonna grab like, a mid blue. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to use the cobalt blue scale 75 paint that I quite regularly use. But you could use something like Calador Sky works well. Um, what's the other ultramarines blue? Calgar blue is that what it's called now? Um, but any of the any of these, you know, kind of mid blues are going to do the job. Uh, and I'm just going to make sort of a 50 50 mix with my Mephiston red, which is going to get me. A pretty rich kind of um, what what I'm aiming for is it's not quite a purple it's kind of more of a, a deep burgundy so it looks something like this you can see you know it's it's pretty dark but it's not it's not like a ton darker than the red that we've already been working with um, but I'm going to make a glaze from it. Have you yeah. used glazes before? This is unfamiliar territory. Okay, that's, no, that's, that's good. That's good. Uh, so, if I just pull my palette forward a second, you can see how thin this paint is. You see it sort of starts to break up as I move it. Okay. Uh, so this, this is a glaze. This is the kind of consistency you're looking for for a glaze. But the really important thing is, is less so than the consistency of the paint, is actually the load on your brush. So after I've got my brush like fully saturated with a glaze, what I'll actually do is completely get rid of most of it. My brush now looks dry, but you'll see here my brush is actually not at all dry. You see that? And and, and that's how you want to be sort of set up for a glaze and then the other important thing with a glaze is that you need to control the direction of your brush strokes so I'm going to apply this to create a shadow underneath that little sort of ridged bit at the top of the leg there and what I'm doing is just constantly pushing upwards and the reason I'm pushing upwards is because with a glaze the intensity of the glaze will always be strongest at the end of the stroke once it starts to build up. You won't see it at first when you uh, when you sort of initially start putting it in you'll think that nothing's happening but as the glaze starts to build up the area where you end your stroke will actually be um, significantly stronger in color than the area where you started your stroke So what we're going to do now is just keep reinforcing this glaze by 
pushing paint upwards towards that knee pad. And then I'm just kind of carrying on a little section around here and then carrying on a little section around the back here. And the actual specifics of where you place your shadows aren't super important. Um, you want to be kind of, you know, trying to think fairly logically. But also there's some stuff that you'll do just because it looks cool. Like on the toe cap here, I always push a little shadow into the middle of the toe cap there. And that's obviously not realistic. It's the top of the foot. It will be directly receiving light. You know, if the light was sort of shining down from above, like on a sunny day, that toe cap would definitely be lit. So to put a shadow in the middle of it is, you know, it's not it's not logical by any measure, but it looks cool. So, you know, a lot of the decisions that you make in miniature painting, um, you're not necessarily trying to do what's realistic all the time. So I've got I've got three coats of this glaze on now and I'm just about starting to see it. But the nice thing is because it has a ton of water in it, it dries very quickly. So doesn't it's not as slow as you might have heard. A lot of people don't like painting with this method because they feel it's too slow. That's sort of the tends to be the main argument against it. I'm actually going to start to glaze downwards on the knee pad as well, just to sort of create a bit of interest there. You can see where my where my wet paint is at the moment, but like I say, it does dry quite quickly, so <clears throat> you do want to be patient. You want to make sure that you're letting each layer of glaze dry before you apply the next. Yeah, just sticking to all of these same places, you know, I'm not really, uh, not really needing to be particularly accurate or careful. Just getting my glazes nicely built up. And what this, what this should do, once you've got about probably six layers on, usually sort of somewhere between six and eight layers, it, it tends to be in my experience, certainly with red anyway. Um, what you should start to see is just the introduction of some shadow building in, but it will be quite subtle. You see I've just got that sort of purple pre-shadow starting to appear. It's, it's subtle, but you can yeah. see it's starting to appear. So that's what you're looking for for the first stage. So it should maybe Probably glaze another layer or two here. I probably shouldn't move on just yet, but, but I'm getting pretty close this side. Is yours starting to starting to change yet, or are you still working it in? Kind of, but I'm not sure that's just, just me being a bit too heavy-handed from inexperience. But that's okay. That's okay. What that's that's definitely what will happen at first is is you will apply too much glaze and you will get blotchiness. Um, and that's fine because you'll you'll learn to smoothen that out just by being more patient and loading your brush more lightly, more conservatively. And that's all, that's all that that's all that's happening. If it's blotchy, you've just gone too fast. That's that's the only thing that that really causes blotchiness when you're glazing. But the, ni the nice thing about this technique is once you understand it, you can do things like those really fancy blended power swords that you see people doing. And because that's, you know, it's it's all done that way. Uh, to, to do a power sword, you just build glazes up in a uniform direction to create an intense fade of color. So it's, you know, it's, it's a technique that's really worth learning because for 40K, it unlocks a lot of kind of staple recipes. I can definitely see some sort of purpley hues starting to appear on yours. So what I'm going to do over here now is add more of that same blue to my red, which is going to take it all the way to a purple now. And we're still going to glaze with it, so 
we, we still want to keep the paint nice and thin but you see this was my original color here at the top of my thing uh, bottom of my thumb and this is the color that I am now at by adding some more blue so you can see I'm still really transparent I'm just much more towards purple now and we're gonna just repeat the process but this time in a smaller area so you know like when you edge highlight you're supposed to kind of shrink the size of the highlights as they get brighter yes yes but it's exactly the same principle we shrink the size of the glazes as we get darker so we're doing exactly the same thing that you'd be used to doing from edge highlighting just in the opposite end of the uh, value spectrum so we're just going darker and darker as we get smaller and smaller but this is where the change will start to be a little bit more dramatic now because you're actually uh, because you've got more saturation in your glaze you're further away from your base color now you can see after one coat that's very obviously purple in the shadows now hair in my brush so obviously you know this this process of placing glazes is um, it's pretty tedious you know you're not going to do this on 40 rank and file miniatures um, this is not this is not a a battle ready workup you know um, what I normally do if I if I want a look that's sort of analogous to this but maybe a little bit easier uh, so that I can actually put it across my rank and file is I'll normally um, actually use an airbrush and I'll spray my blood angels for example purple first and then spray mephiston red as a highlight um, and that's kind of you know that's kind of a cheats way of, of getting something similar to this if you don't want to sit and spend the time with this obviously very slow process of glazing But, I mean, you can you can see from mine now. I've got a pretty clear transition starting to build. I've got a bit of wet paint there still, but you know, there's a color transition starting to really show now. So I've been kind of lucky here in the, for the most part, my glazes have been fairly tidy. Um, and that's mostly just because I've done this specific red one enough times that, you know, I kind of know the speed to work out. But if you do have any issues, you can make a glaze from your original base color. And if the, if the sort of transitions going into the glaze are a bit rough, you can just kind of glaze back out of them like this kind of build back up towards red and sometimes that can be worth doing if you even if you didn't necessarily make a mistake but you maybe just made the shadow a little bit too big and then just you know popping in some red like this to just to sort of 
shrink the shadow can be a good idea. And the nice thing is because we're using Mephiston Red, you're using Mephiston Red as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, so because we're using Mephiston Red, it's such a high coverage color that we sort of have a very easy time doing this anyway. And you can see now that that almost immediately has just kind of fixed those areas that were that were looking just a little bit too dark. There's a little bit of dustiness there from the, uh, it's just because I've used matte paints in conjunction with satin paints. I wouldn't normally do that. That dustiness wouldn't be there if I'd used all matte paints or all satin paints, but it's just the mixing of the mediums. You can fix that afterwards if that does occur. A coat of satin varnish or a coat, um, a bit of Lamian medium over it, something like that, will get rid of that dustiness if, uh, if you do ever get it. But what, what usually causes it is just mixing paint ranges. Certain mediums react together and turn milky. So if you if you ever notice that happening, don't don't be panicked by it. You're a little bit out of focus, but it does look like you've got the same effect. It looks like you've got sort of a nice transition of purple to red on the flat surface and then a few little kind of spot areas. Console. Yeah, there we go. Now I can really see. Oh yeah, that looks brilliant. That's so much easier to see now. That's fantastic. So what I would do is, you see just down at the the very, very bottom, um, just where your Grieve, oh, hang on, I'm trying to control a cursor that I can't see, just in here. Yeah. Uh, I would probably just pull that back up towards red a little. So the same way that I corrected mine, by just glazing a tiny bit of pure red down here. I would probably just pull that up a little bit more. Just to make sure that you've got a good def defined border because that's where you're going to place a highlight. So you want a nice clearly defined border there. We're looking good though. Yeah, that's looking really nice. So you've got a nice highlight towards the top of that leg plate and you've got some nice definition towards the bottom so that you can start to place highlights in. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm stepping up to, um, I think it's Wild Rider Red is the next one in the sequence. Yeah. yeah. No, Evil Sun Scarlet, sorry, is the next one that I use. But, you know, you can just add a touch of yellow to Mephiston Red if you don't have it. It's, it's just a slightly more orangey toned red. Um, and I'm basically just going to do the opposite thing now. I'm just going to carefully glaze in some pre-highlighting. So in the same way that we used the burgundy to pre-shade and then use the purple to shade, we can use a sort of orangey red to pre-highlight and then use an orange to highlight. And so this is exactly the same process that we've just done, only this time we're going up in value. Value, if, if you're not familiar with the term, uh, I, I actually don't really like using the term, but there's not, it's it's very easy to, to um, really miscommunicate color information if you don't use it. Um, value is, is what most people call lightness. Um, you're effectively taking the color more towards the white end of the spectrum. Um, but often as you increase in value when you when you increase in value using typical painting methods because you're normally adding a white you're normally desaturating at the same time and the understanding of saturation and value is kind of quite important to being able to um, get your miniatures highlighted nicely. So what we're doing here is we're, instead of adding yellows, um, sorry, instead of adding whites to build up our highlights, which would cause desaturation, we're effectively adding yellows, which is still higher, it's still higher in value, it's still a lighter color, but they don't desaturate as much, which means that we don't get these really sort of washed out pinky looking highlights which is what we typically want to avoid when painting red 
there are definitely some areas where that's a good idea but for most painting of red we normally want to sort of keep it looking rich as we as we make it look brighter and so just from that just from that first pre highlight you can already see like a pretty radical difference in what I'm doing here do you see how my edges are suddenly way more defined like if you look at this edge here this bottom edge here the, the front leading toe and then at the back here this sort of highlight that I've started to build in here and the ball of the heel at the top here you see it really really quickly starts to produce definition little sneaky trick uh, your your miniature doesn't have a knee pad like mine but another little sneaky trick yeah. is also to put a highlight on the bottom of the knee pad here because what that what that does it's Realistically, it probably wouldn't look like that under most types of lighting, but by having a, a little highlight on the bottom of the knee pad here, I end up with a highlight placed right next to a really deep shadow, which again is just, it's gonna do wonders yeah. for shape definition. Okay, can you just rotate the miniature for me just a little bit more towards that leg? Yeah, that's looking good. So you started to build in your oranges now. You've got your kind of pre-highlight. And before we step up to a proper highlight, again, same as we did last time, if we grab a glaze of Mephiston Red, we can just look at any areas where we've maybe transitioned a bit too quickly, and we can just clean them up a little bit. Um, and again, you know, if you if you've just got it perfectly right first time then you know congratulations don't worry about it but if you haven't you should never feel like you've kind of ruined your miniature you know that's that's not the case a um, couple of quick corrections and you'll be back on track so never never panic if you end up in that situation where things are looking a little bit you know like the transitions are jumping too quick or like things are a bit blotchy or whatever blotchiness is usually solved either by applying more coats or by just slowing down when you apply the coats and uh, jaggedy transitions are usually resolved just by glazing back with the previous color so you can see the transition here now is uh, a little bit cleaner I still need to do maybe another pass or two but this transition here into the highlight is a lot cleaner now than it was a second ago yeah. You can you can see the midtone starting to appear. I'll just bring that zoom up again for you. Just on the very very edge of the highlight here, you can see that there's a midtone just starting to appear. I just need to reinforce that a little basically. So maybe one or two more passes with Mephiston Red. Alright, that's looking excellent. Um I'm seeing just at the at the very top of your foot, this this little crease here. Is perhaps a little bit bright the little crease under the leg plate um, you don't necessarily have to fix it now but I would probably try and just get a bit more purple just placed into that little crease under there okay. just to create a nice bit of shadowing so from here once we've got to this stage you've kind of got two options um, if you want to be fairly quick you probably only do one more highlight or you can go all the way up to something really bright so I usually have Wild Rider Red and Jacaro Orange on hand when I do this and Wild Rider Red is pretty much just a color that will reinforce uh, Evil Sun Scarlet it's not it's not a particularly um, hard-hitting color so you see if I put it into this highlight here, it's just gonna help sort of reinforce that bright center line. 
and I can also just kind of work it across the top here maybe the center here and again obviously if you don't if you don't have these exact colors um, there's nothing wrong with mixing there's nothing wrong with you know using things that are sort of nearby you should never feel like you have to have the exact colors you see in a recipe But again, you can see I've already just had a leap forward in brightness, um, and I'm, you know, I'm still I'm being more delicate. Like I'm still shrinking the area of all of these highlights. I'm still keeping them as fine as possible. But just that application of one more color into the mix produces a huge leap forward in brightness. can almost kind of imagine if we were painting this entire space marine you know this this bright orange highlight that's here you would extend it up sort of here as well you'd have it on the edge here yeah. um, and it would really start to create like quite a quite a striking uh, range of, of highlights it can be a little bit difficult to visualize when you're just sort of dealing with a small area of one miniature Um, and then the crucial one is kind of whether or not you want to bring in the, the Jacaro orange. Um, what I would normally do at this point is I would just start to I'd grab the Jacaro orange and, and I wouldn't even have it at a glaze consistency. I'd just have it sort of at a thin layer consistency. Um, and I'd just tap it into a few kind of extremities just to create some little points of accent here and there. And use it really really sparingly uh, because personally I, I mean obviously I started doing this back in the 90s where Games Workshop were sort of painting everything really really over bright and oversaturated um, and, and that's kind of left me with a bit of a distaste for miniatures that are kind of too bright and poppy I have a bit of a limit with it you know how much of it I can take But you can see even with just a, a couple of really fine layered highlights just added at the last minute there, that still just makes the whole work up really pop. Now in terms of Tyranid miniatures, um, this would probably be a really good way to, for example, treat those huge scything talons on the, on the bigger monsters. You know, if they're going to have the black carapace kind of leading into the scything talon, then having the actual talon itself in this really nice, bright, high contrast red would look super cool. And again, if you if you get to this point, like I say, I've just added little tiny little dots of Jacaro orange there. But if you get to this point and you do think you want to just, you know, pop a little bit more brightness, um, a bit of white mixed into Jacaro orange, and you you actually will deliberately be wanting to desaturate for these final highlights because otherwise they'll look really really crazy. But um, you can just kind of catch the very very corner of anything that's sharply angled. And I do mean, you know, just the real tiny little corners. If you're familiar with side brushing, that will become your friend here. Where you use kind of the flat of your brush to keep you uh, 
highlighting along a sort of razor's edge. But you can see, I mean, at the back here is probably the best place to show this because you can kind of see all the individual colors. You can see I've just, the final color that's got the white in it, I mean, I've literally just painted a tiny little T of it there. You know, it's minuscule. But look how much it makes the, the whole highlight scheme pop when you actually zoom back out to like a normal viewing distance. You know, we've, we've got a, a tiny little dot of it in the corner there, but like it really, really shows when you glance at the miniature. Yours looks brilliant, by the way. Your, your camera, um, I think your phone's camera pushes um, the saturation of reds quite a lot, which tends to be something that phone cameras do because it makes people's faces look healthier when they're on Skype. Um, I think that's why yours looks orangier than mine because I know you've been using similar colors to me It could also be the color of lighting. Yeah. Yeah. My lighting is very very white because it's all LED um, But I actually there. think from you know if I'm trying to kind of Separate that out and look at what you've done. I think what you've got is actually really close to what I've got. That's brilliant. And your blend looks really smooth here. I mean, again, you know, you can see it in person. I don't know how it looks in person, but on camera, it looks very, very smooth. Yeah, I'd go a little bit brighter just on that, yeah, on that extreme top ridge there. If you just use the side of your brush um, and just kind of glance along it like this with one of your really bright colors, it'll, it'll just hit the very, very top. I think that'll give you a really good look. Yeah, something like that. That's super bright. Right on the tip. That's it. That's it. The last couple of hairs of the brush. Beautiful. So you've got fantastic brush control. Thanks. Brilliant, yeah, like that's really made it pop now. If you look at it head on now, it just really, really like draws your eye towards that that point of interest. And when you've got all of those kind of, you know, purples and, and you're sort of subduing the overall brightness of everything and then just accenting these spots where you where you want to direct the observer to look, that's kind of the the that's the sort of the effect you're going for, really. You wanna you want to use highlight placement to tell the observer where to look at your miniature. And so you see, glazes aren't really nearly as scary as people think they are. I mean, you've you've got a good result out of that the first time you've done it. You know, it's you, you said it was uh, uncharted territory for you, but you wouldn't think that that's a first Very attempt. It, it doesn't look like a first attempt at all. Thanks. I was guided by a great, great teacher. teacher. <laughs> I don't know that I'm a great teacher. I'm, a, I'm an all right painter, but the teaching part is the is the bit that I'm still learning. So there you have it. That's about the first sort of half hour or so of the lesson. In the second half of the lesson, we did go over a textured red workup as well, which is a, a non-blending way in order to uh, achieve a sort of similar look on the red, but with more deliberate texture added to it. And that was also very interesting, and I may bring that to you in another video, but I do show a lot of texture painting, so uh, I figured that one was less necessary than the glazing. I really hope you liked it, folks, that you learned something from it get at me in the comments if there's anything that you'd like further explained or if you just want to talk to me about what you've seen in this video today that would be absolutely awesome if you did like the video of course you can hit that thumbs up button to let me know that you liked it you can subscribe to the channel and enable notifications to be able to stay up to date on what i'm doing over here and there is also a patreon campaign which you can pledge to starting from as little as one american dollar a month what's that 60 70p something like that with some amazing benefits there that can get you access to my discord and early access to videos and all sorts of other cool stuff so folks i'm gonna stop nattering in your ear rolls now because you have just sat through quite a long video but i'll see you in the next one and thank you for watching